scripture reading for this morning is Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. You can find that and follow along in your New Testaments on page 245 near the end of the book. And we are going to include that in the sermon today. So as we prepare to hear God's word and God's message, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. An ocean-going ship sailing past a remote island spots a man who has been stranded there for several years. And the captain goes ashore to rescue the man, and when he does, he notices three primitive huts built on the edge of the island. So he asks the man he's rescuing, what are these huts for? Well, the man points at the first one and says, that's my house. What's the second hut for? Well, that's my church. And the third hut? Oh, that, sniffs the castaway with an air of bitterness. That's the church I used to go to. The second and third chapters of the book of Revelation are all about churches. Beautiful, messy, divine, human churches. If you've ever spent time participating in the life of a church beyond just sitting in the pews on Sunday morning, then you already know this quite well. Churches may be inspired by God, meant to be places of holiness and love, but the reality is that churches are made up of and made by very human, very imperfect people. Every church we learned last week as we were reading Revelation, has a spirit, an ethos that grows and changes through the years, sometimes closer to God's ideals and sometimes far from it. And so last week, when we began to learn of John of Patmos and the vision that he had of Jesus who commanded him to write letters to the seven churches in Asia, we see a lot of ourselves when we read about these churches and we think of the churches that we have belonged to through the years. And yet at the same time, and in keeping with Revelation's theme of past, present, and future, the letters that John of Patmos writes to these seven churches are also very intimate and personal, very wrapped up in the complexities of the past and difficult to understand fully unless you're familiar with the concerns and the conventions of both Jewish and Roman culture and those specific regions in the second century. We're going to take a look at some of those messages today. There are seven in total. We'll get through about maybe four of them, and we're going to look for patterns and insight in each of the letters for our own spiritual lives and the building of our own spiritual community. So chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. And when John says to the angel, angel is a Greek word that means messenger. And so this could be him saying, write to the spirit of the church, but it also could be him simply saying, write to the messenger who's going to take this to the church. We really don't know. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And if you'll remember, that's a reference from last week to John's vision of Jesus in the first chapter. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But 
I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Last week we talked about the theme of past, present, and future that runs throughout the book of Revelation. And it's in every one of these letters too. Through John's words, God praises the present day strengths of the church in Ephesus, their loyalty to good teaching, and their patient endurance through some challenging times where persecution was beginning to happen. But then he reminds them of their past, of the love that you had at first and how far they have fallen from this ideal. He calls them back to that love and then he predicts both future consequences if they keep their current trajectory and future rewards if they're able to turn themselves around. So that is the pattern that we'll see in each letter. A summary of the present day church a look back at its past and where it's come from, and a look forward with both opportunities and consequences depending on how the church reacts. Now, this first letter is to the church in Ephesus, and in 2017, I had the opportunity to visit this ancient city along with faces, a few familiar faces that you well know, with James, who was with me at the time, and also Michael Simance, who preached here uh, a month or two ago. And these pictures that we took while we were in Ephesus give just a small sense of the grandeur that this city must have once possessed. Ephesus was certainly one of the most famous and prosperous cities in the entire Roman Empire. The problem with that is when you're on top of the world, so to speak, it's easy to forget where you came from. And it's easy to forget the God who really controls the universe. And so when John speaks of removing your lampstand from its place, He's talking about taking the city of Ephesus down a few pegs on a more metaphorical level. But there's probably another meaning, too, a more literal meaning. The city of Ephesus was an important harbor. And on several occasions, the waterways leading into the city would fill up with silt and debris, requiring the entire city to shift and change its position to literally as John says, to be removed from its place. I like that in this letter, there's this small reminder that no matter how magnificent your buildings and your cities are, God is still ultimately in control of the forces of nature that we depend on to build those cities. Verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have affliction. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. Now there's a lot of contrasting language in this short message. First, last, death, 
life, dead, alive, riches, poverty, those who claim to be Jewish but are in fact not. And the history of the city of Smyrna is a back and forth roller coaster ride story indeed. In the first century, Smyrna was a thriving city, a very close and faithful ally of the Roman Empire. And all of the beautiful buildings were at the center of the city, were situated on a hill, and they came to be called the Crown of Smyrna. But the city had also been completely destroyed twice in its history, once by an attack from the neighboring Lydians and once by a devastating earthquake. So in the second century, when John wrote Revelation, Smyrna was probably in a rebuilding phase, hence the reference to its affliction and its poverty. It was a city that had been first among cities and was now last, had been alive and was now all but dead. The message, I think, to Smyrna is give your allegiance, your loyalty, your faithfulness, not to the emperor, but to God. You may be tested in this or even imprisoned like John himself was, but if you are faithful, in place of your ruined crown, in other words, your city, your buildings, you will receive a crown that no one can take away from you, a crown of life. Verse 12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Once again, a reference to the vision that John had in chapter 1. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has an ear to listen, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone, and on the white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. There's a lot of warlike language and imagery in the message to the church of Pergamum, the sharp two-edged sword, the threat that God will make war against them, and the promises made to those who conquer. Pergamum was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia, where all seven of our churches are located. In other words, it was the Washington, D.C. of its region. Hence, probably, the designation as the place where Satan lives. It's a subtle dig at the Roman emperor. Rome was very much a war-driven empire, and so this message speaks in language and terminology that probably made a lot of sense to the inhabitants of the city. In this message, for the second time, we hear about the teaching of the Nicolaitans as something that's objectionable. There's also a reference to the teaching of Balaam, who was a prophet in the Old Testament and an enemy of Israel. In order to understand what the problem is here with these false teachers, it's helpful to know that in the year 50, the earliest Christians held a council in Jerusalem. You can read about that in the book of Acts. Their new religion, Christianity, was spreading quickly, although they did not consider it to be a new religion. They still thought of themselves as very much Jewish. They just believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But a lot of non-Jewish people were starting to declare their allegiance to Jesus, and they were asking the question, do we need to also become Jewish? Do we need to specifically be circumcised? And so the church gathered, the early church gathered its leaders in Jerusalem to decide 
what to do. And they decided that all of these new converts, the Gentiles, did not in fact have to become Jewish. They just had to follow, in addition to their faithfulness to Jesus, they had to follow two simple rules. Don't eat food that had been offered to pagan gods in the temple. And don't engage in activity considered to be sexually inappropriate. Now, those two things are important because those two things, more than anything else, were the things that Romans did as part of their government-sanctioned practice of religion. They offered food in the temples to the Roman gods, which was then subsequently distributed to people, and they exchanged in sexual intercourse with temple prostitutes. Now, following those two rules may sound really simple and reasonable at first. Don't do that. Okay. But you've got to realize that if you didn't go to the Roman temple and do the things that Romans did, you would stand out like a sore thumb and you would quickly begin to risk being seen as a threat to the status quo and to Roman rule. You could lose your job, you could lose your reputation, and even your life. Enter the Nicolaitans. Now we don't really know a whole lot about them, but the best guess is that their leader, Nicolaitus, was teaching these early Christians that it was okay to follow both religions at the same time, to act like a Roman on Monday through Saturday and act like a Christian on Sunday. And I suspect we all know people who follow that very same philosophy today, right? On Sunday, they sit in church and talk about loving their neighbor and turning the other cheek. And then on weekdays, they go about the business of exploiting their neighbors for profit, for pleasure, or personal gain. And so the message here to Pergamians in every age is that if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Instead, for those who conquer that tendency, pun intended by John, God promises manna from heaven. And you'll remember manna was the food given to the Israelites in ancient Egypt as they fled, in ancient Israel as they fled from Egypt. In other words, God will give you food provided by God instead of provided by the pagan temples. God also promises a white stone inscribed with a new name. Now, I don't think this is one of those cute little pebble pocket stones that you put in your pocket to remember something. Actually, when we were in the city of Ephesus, we came across these big giant slabs of white stone all the time. And you can't see it too well in this picture, but there are names inscribed, chiseled into the stone, names of perhaps the builder of the building, names of the patron who financed the building. And so I think this promise of a stone with God's name written on it is a way of saying that if you put your faith in the builder and the patron of the universe, he will put his name and therefore his blessing on the foundation stone of your life. The next message is to the church at Theatira. It is in many ways very similar to what we've seen before, although it too has its own very specific references and allusions that only the people who read the letter would have understood given their context. Uh, we are going to fast forward, however, to the next chapter, and we're going to look at one last message. So chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. There's our reference to the vision. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. 
Yet, you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Sardis was one of the oldest cities in Asia, dating all the way back to 1200 BC. It was once the capital city of the Lydian Empire, the people who had destroyed the city of Smyrna that we talked about earlier. But by the time we get to the writing of the book of Revelation, it was a city in decline, on the point of death, as the message indicates. Twice in its history, it was the victim of surprise midnight attacks from neighboring armies. This is what the message alludes to when it says, If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. That's a message crafted very much to get the attention of people who had lived through that kind of experience. Now, the claim to fame in Sardis is that the Sardinians invented the process by which wool, in other words, clothing, was dyed into different colors. They were known for their wool industry and for their dyeing. And there's a great play on words that runs throughout this message when God, through John, says to them, you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled, or in other words, dyed or colored your clothes. You still have a few people whose clothes are still white. In other words, not dyed. That play on words continues in the promise that for those few, I will not blot or die or color your name out of the book of life. Just like in the message to the city of Ephesus, Sardis is reminded of its former days and its former glory. Remember then what you have received and heard. In other words, you still have a great name, a great reputation, but you're not living up to it. Of all of the messages to the seven churches, this is the one that most hits home for me as I consider the past, the present, and the future of First Presbyterian Church here in El Paso. Founded 139 years ago, we are one of the oldest churches in the city. And at one time, we were easily the largest church in El Paso, the church that all other churches look to for leadership and inspiration. We built Providence Hospital. We built the city's very first accredited preschool. We built this sanctuary, the largest of its kind when it was built, and in my opinion, still the most beautiful. And for a time, we filled this room to the brim with generations of El Pasoans who were baptized here, raised here, married here, discipled here, and ultimately commended into God's hands right here in this sacred place. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We are now a church on the point of irrelevance, obscurity, and death. Look around you right now. And that fact is painfully obvious. As much as I think we'd like to blame COVID-19 and believe that people will come back when they feel safe, the truth is we've actually been in a pattern of decline for the last three decades at least. COVID just accelerated that process. Now, I have only been a part of that decline for the past nine years, and most of you here today far less than that. So it would be very easy for us to say, well, that's not our fault. And that may be true, but we're not entirely off the hook. God says to the church at Sardis, you still have a few people who walk with me. 
And it is precisely to these few that the message is addressed. You are the ones who have the ability today in the present to wake up and strengthen what remains. If you don't, the name of this church, its history, its legacy, and its capacity for good will eventually be blotted out forever. That's a prophecy. But remember, there are always two prophecies. There's always a choice, a prediction, and a promise. If you conquer, and the Greek word for conquer here is nikon, it means to actively overcome the obstacles in your way. It's where the brand name Nike gets their name from. In other words, if we just do it, and I'm not even sure exactly what it is in this case, but that's never stopped creative and passionate people before. If we overcome the past and the present trajectory that we are on, then our name will not be blotted out in the future, but instead will be proclaimed in the heavens before God and all his angels. I think that's a promise worth leaning into, worth living into, and worth a whole lot more of our time, our energy, and our efforts than we think we have to give. But as always, and just as with the seven churches, to whom John writes, it's up to us in the present. Who? Me? I want you to do something for me right now. I want you to reach up and touch your ear. Right or left, doesn't matter. Hang on to it for a little while. You got one, right? Okay, so to answer the question, who? Revelation 3, 6. Let anyone who has an ear Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let us pray. God, we would love for you to call somebody else to stand up and do the things that we know you are calling us to do. We know that anything worth establishing, growing, preserving, caring for, is worth and takes a whole lot of time and a whole lot of effort, a whole lot of faithfulness, a whole lot of prayer. Give us the courage and the conviction to be those people. Help us, like the church of Sardis, to wake up, to remember the love and the zeal that we had for you decades and decades ago when this church was doing so much for the people of El Paso and the community here. Let that be our spirit again. Let us be the ones to carry your love and your message of hope to all the people in our community. We pray these things just as you have taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.